direct from the lectionary, um, and uh, quite challenging, uh, especially I think because um, it's the, the, the Luke passage in particular is, is difficult to be clear and definitive about because of the, the mixture of immediate relevance to the, the disciples that he was talking to, and also future application. Um, and so he's talking, Jesus is talking here about the fall of Jerusalem, which would come roughly 40 years after he was speaking these words. Uh, and he's also speaking about the end times, the last days, the, the, the return of the Messiah. Um, and it's not uh, unique to this passage that you find that kind of double application of uh, prophetic words in particular. You find it in the Old Testament, in, uh, for instance, in the prophecies about the Messiah. And if you read some of the passages, even, um, uh, you know, you, you read some and they, they clearly uh, speak directly to the, the first coming of Jesus, talking about his birth, where he'll be born, how it'll be, and, and so on. But there's other <coughs> passages that uh, refer to both the first coming and the second coming. And uh, so you have this kind of, of prophetic um, design which leaves us a bit hanging as to exactly what and when uh, is, is uh, concerned here. So what can we draw from what we read there that's helpful for our living as Christians today? Because I think that's really the essence of, of what we need to be doing. We don't want to get engaged in speculation about has this bit been fulfilled, has that bit been fulfilled, what's going to happen next, and so on. But rather, how does this impact my life for today? How does it help me to live for Jesus today? Um, now, Mike was asking uh, before the, the service started, he said, oh, well, well, we'll be getting a three-point sermon today, will we? And I said, no, there's only two points. <laughs> so, sorry, it's a substandard sermon today. But, um, anyway, I'll maybe make up with it by having several subdivisions to the second point. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. So, first point is this. Don't get preoccupied by systems and dates. Amen. Now, what were the disciples preoccupied with at this point? As they're looking at the temple, as Jesus is telling them, this is going to, going, it's not going to last. It's going. It's time limited. So what's their preoccupation? Oh, when is it going to happen? How is it going to be? And you know, there's a, a real danger in us getting bogged down in trying to work out when is Jesus coming back? Have you heard that sort of speculation? Mm -hmm. um, just the other, well, uh, uh, maybe six years ago or so, there was a huge lot of speculation going on about blood moons. And oh, there's all these blood moons coming. Jesus is coming back very soon. And when I'm saying all this, please don't uh, doubt that I, whether I believe in Jesus coming back or not. Of course I do. He said it, he's going to do it. And around us, yes, there are all the signs of what are called the last days. But he specifically said to us, don't speculate. And one of the big dangers, I think, for many of us is that we get so caught up in trying to work out, is he coming back next week? Is he coming back tomorrow? This, this particular event, a sign of his coming... And one of the big ones at the moment, by the way, is about the European Union. And one of the, the reasons for Brexit that is given by evangelical Christians is that Europe is the new Babylon. <laughs> now, there's lots of evidence, actually, that you can draw up to support that. The design, for instance, of the European Parliament building is of the Tower of Babel. That is not speculation, that's a fact. 
They were the members of the original. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, yeah, I can compare. Very similar. Um, the, in, in Berlin, there's a museum which actually has rebuilt uh, a part of ancient Babylon. It's not a replica, it's the real thing. And it's there in Berlin. So people take these things and say, oh, that means that, uh, that Europe, the European Union, is the beast. And that the second coming is very near. Now, that it may be. Please don't say, think I'm saying it's not. It may be, but to weigh against that is the fact that in every generation of the church, since Jesus went back to glory, there have been similar speculations and similar statements about the age in which people lived. At times, people have gathered on mountaintops to wait for the return of Jesus because they've become so, so convinced <coughs> that these signs are being fulfilled in their time. And we only need to look at uh, the Jehovah's <laughs> Witnesses, for instance, who've now had their third, I think it is, date from the second coming of Jesus <laughs> proved wrong. And so many others have done similar things. So don't get preoccupied by systems and dates because it distracts us from following Jesus in our daily living. If he's coming back, the, the thinking may be, if he's coming back tomorrow, well, really, uh, let's not bother about this world. Let's not bother about the people around us. Let's not bother about the gospel being preached. Let's just <coughs> speculate about him coming back and think about what it'd be like once he does. Jesus says it here in, in the passage in verse 8, Watch out that you're not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming I am he. And listen to this one. The time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, don't be frightened. These things must happen first. But the end will not come right away. And then the parallel passage in Matthew, when, uh, which is much longer than this, and the fact that we didn't read anything like the whole passage in Luke anyway, but uh, in, Ma in Matthew it's much fuller, and Jesus says there, no one knows the date, <coughs> not even the Son, only the Father who is in heaven. So don't get preoccupied by systems and dates, that's the first thing. Sorry if I've... Um, harped on a bit about that, but uh, it's something that really concerns me because I, I feel that so many uh, get caught up in this to the neglect of living for Jesus now. The second thing I would say is don't be shaken by events in the world around us. And let's take that out of the context of thinking about even about um, the second coming. Let's just think about the the situation in the world today. Jesus forecasts wars, natural disasters, persecution. What an encouraging passage to read, isn't it? <laughs> this is what your life is going to be like. And it's true. We've already mentioned the, the B word, Brexit, and uh, all the hassle and all the stress and all the disruption that that's caused. <laughs> There's mid the Middle East and the, the potential for world, for the world being engulfed in the conflicts there. There's all the business of climate change and the, the changing weather everywhere. We've got the floods in, in England. Uh, I was speaking to a friend in Russia yesterday and he said they uh, had such unusual weather this year that uh, normally this time of year they have snow. Well, they've got snow just now, but last week it was, there was no snow and there should be, and the week before that there was snow, it's all completely up in the air. So different, so many things going on. The rise in persecution across the world. And uh, in case you think it's uh, limited to particular countries or situations, I, uh, I was reading um, this week of a nurse I think in the UK, I don't know exactly where, but certainly in the Western world somewhere, a nurse 
who was sacked by for giving a patient a Bible. I don't know the background, I don't know if the patient had asked for the Bible or what, but the nurse was sacked for giving the patient a Bible. And we've had all sorts of similar cases to that over the years. Um, the intolerance is, is rising in, in our society as well as across the world. Jesus said, don't be shaken by these things. If he's able to predict these things and do it very accurately, and if you read on, you, you, you see that he, he talks about the fall of Jerusalem, very clearly predicting that Jerusalem will have not one stone left on the other and, and you know, that it's coming and it happened. Then the other things he predicts are also accurate. And you see it even in, this, uh, in the description of the times that we live in, that these things are happening. This is the world we live in. But he says, don't be shaken. If he is able to protect them, then it's because God knows about them. It's not taking God by surprise <coughs> that the climate is changing, if it is. It's not taking him by surprise that there are wars across the globe. It's not taking him by surprise that people who follow Jesus are being persecuted. He knows about it. He knew about it before it ever happened. But it's all also encompassed in his plans. I don't mean to say by that that he planned these things to happen, but rather that he knows about it and has taken it all into account in terms of his dealing with the world and particularly in his dealings with us. Now I want us to note the encouragement that Jesus gives us in these verses because we can get so taken up by the doom and gloom of it all that we miss out on the encouragement that he gives us in the midst of it all. In the verse 9 he says, When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. One of the most frequent phrases in, this, in the Bible is, do not be afraid. Do not be frightened. Verse 13, he says that all these upsets and uh, the particularly the business of persecution, this will result, he says, in your being witnesses to these people. Don't worry about what you're going to have to say. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist <coughs> or contradict. So one of the, the, the big things I know for me in, in terms of thinking about facing um, opposition or, or persecution, whether it's verbal opposition or whether it's actual physical persecution, is how will I react to it? How could I speak? How could I answer accusations and threats and, and so on? Jesus says, don't worry, it's okay. You'll get the, the words and the wisdom when it comes. And we can spend our time uh, worrying about things that will never happen. But that distracts us then from experiencing the love of God and living the love of God. Year of now. Verse 18, Jesus says, Not a hair of your head will perish. Now, for some of us, that's a bigger promise than for others. <laughs> <laughs> but he says, Not a hair on your head will perish. He's promising his protection, his keeping, his love, and his power to be with us. And he says this in verse 19, by standing firm, you will gain life. We fear death often, particularly um, we can fear a violent death, if it's persecution we're talking about. We fear, many of us fear um, a, a painful death, whether it's <coughs> through uh, illness or, or whatever else. But Jesus says, as we stand firm, will gain life. 
Because beyond this experience of life, there's something more. There's something bigger. We'll look at that in a minute. But just at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus gives those familiar words when he says, go into all the world and make disciples. He's telling us, this is, this is your role, this is what you're to be doing with your lives here and now, this is what you're to be doing with your lives in the face of the second coming and everything that will creep, uh, that will go before it. Go into the world and make disciples and so on. And then he says, I am with you always, <coughs> even to the end of the age. Rather than speculating about the end of the age, let's focus on the promise of the presence of Jesus. Focus on the promise of life that he gives us. He says, anyone who comes to me will receive life in all its fullness. Not just pie in the sky when you die. As I've said before, cake in the plate while you eat. The life of Jesus within us and for us. To nourish us, to strengthen us, to fill us. <clears throat> and I want to finish just with these words from Revelation 21. Where Jesus has come back. The end of this world has come. And this is what we look for. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. When we lived in Orkney, I used to hold on to that verse because the passage of water between Orkney and the mainland of Scotland is one of the worst in the world. <laughs> and the number of times I was sick on the boat going from Orkney to the mainland, I thought, there'll be no more sea! <laughs> anyway, I don't think that's what it means. Uh, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Listen to this. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. That's what we're to look forward to. Meantime, let's not get distracted. Let's not be shaken, but know that the presence of Jesus is with us now and to the end of the age. Amen. Amen.